was doing my theological studies and uh, we came to the stage where we had to do a, a synopsis of the Bible and particularly the New Testament and I did a survey of the Gospel of John. Anybody here like the Gospel of John? John, John is powerful to me because, because the Gospel of John, John was the youngest of the disciples. John was probably the most impressionable, but yet he had this great love for Jesus and, and, and we see that, that he was intimate with Jesus in so many ways. And then we also know that all of the disciples that were all crucified or, or died or martyred, whatever, only John lived a full life. I think that's interesting because he was the one that was standing beside Jesus' mother, Mary, at the cross. And he says, woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And when Helen and I were in Turkey, um, as history tells us and legend tells us that, that John went to Asia Minor, which was Turkey, and, and Mary went with him. And John wrote the book of Revelation on the island of Patmos, which was just off the Turkish coast. And so we see that all of this comes together, that John saw vividly the life of Jesus Christ and the transformation that happened with the, pre the spreading of the gospel in the first century. And so I love John. And so what I'm going to do with you this morning is I'm going to preach the entire gospel of John from chapter 1 to chapter 21. How excited are you about that? You should be out of here by lunchtime tomorrow. So let's, uh, let's get into it. Look, if you can indulge me for about 20, 25 minutes, I know. I want to open up the Bible because in this day and age, we have one solid foundation. His name is Jesus Christ. We have the written word of God, the Logos, the written word of God. And John encapsulates it so well. So from chapter 1 to chapter 21, each chapter gives us a picture, a, 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 a portrait, if you want, of Jesus Christ in his unique and powerful way. And it's enough to sustain John and all of his teaching and all of the first century through to the 21st century. So look, has anybody here read the Bible and found themselves picturing images of what they see in the Bible? Does anybody, we think in pictures, don't we? For example, do you ever picture David facing Goliath down in that valley and that stream, picking up the stones and swirling, twirling them around? Does you ever see it? I do. What about when Moses comes to the Red Sea and he puts his staff down and the, and the sea just parts and the children of Israel walk through? Now we've seen the movies, but we all got the picture in our head. What about the picture of Jesus on the cross? Have we got a picture of Jesus on the cross? What about Jesus on the hillside when the people follow him out and he gives this wonderful teaching, but yet then they're hungry and suddenly the bread and the loaves appear, uh, the bread and the fishes appear, and Jesus feeds 5,000. Could you picture yourself standing right beside that little boy and, and Jesus takes it and blesses it, offers it up to heaven and a miracle happens? What about Peter stepping out of the boat in the midst of a storm? Anybody ever been out in a boat in a storm? It's not a pretty place. But yet Jesus calls Peter and Peter goes out. I have these vivid pictures of what happens and the word of God is so clearly and visibly displayed. And I believe that, that theologically... Uh, the, the Gospel of John lines up brilliantly. I did this Gospel because it's known as the Gospel of Love. The Gospel of Love. Anybody heard the Gospel of John be called the Gospel of Love? Have you heard that? So I'm going to preach the entire Gospel. And so we'll see how John's Gospel lines up chapter after chapter. And all of the 21 chapters, as I say, they point a picture of Jesus. And I, and I love this. You know, Paul says... Um, I seek to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Remember Paul said that? And John is saying the same thing. I seek to know nothing else except my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what John saw. So I want to put up this morning, uh, you've got that first slide. Yeah, the pictures of Jesus in, jo in the Gospel of John. And now there's a key verse in John chapter 20, verse 31. And I put this slide up, please. It says, verse 31, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's almost a John 3.16. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So here we go. 
and I will briefly but hopefully clarify the Gospel of John so that whenever you read the Gospel of John now, you will see it in the dynamic pictures of what was John was speaking about. Now remember, John was also the author of the book of Revelation that he wrote on the island of Patmos. And it was all written in signs and, and miracles for people to understand what he was saying. John is still writing in that same way here in this Gospel. And if it draws you to be more intimate, with the person of Jesus Christ and more intimate with your neighbour to both love and worship God together, I think we've come a long way as a church. Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. And with all my heart today, I want you to come out of here more in love with Jesus than you have ever been in your life and more than ever relying on the truth of the gospel of Jesus as your saving grace. Okay, this is to empower the church to an unempowered world. This is to take the gospel of Jesus Christ out as bread and water and life to the broken of this world. So I'm going to preach John to you this morning, okay? 21 chapters. Here we go. Chapter 1. Chapter 1. Up we come. First slide. You're going to have to work with me now. Chapter 1 talks about he is what? The Son of God. His deity is portrayed in this way. Wow. In verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, in verse 14, it says, We have seen His glory, and the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is a picture of the perfect divinity of Jesus Christ that, Paul, that, that John is painting here this morning. John knew Him intimately. John says, This Jesus is God himself because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God the word was God so the chapter 1 virtually says Jesus Christ look at this son of God chapter 2 that yeah, was quick wasn't it you'll see that picture if you read John 1 you'll see it now every chapter has this divine picture in it chapter 2 next slide he shows that Jesus is who the son of man here John's showing us a picture of his perfect humanity. The first miracle that we read is revealed here when Jesus goes to the wedding feast of Cana, does he not? There he mingles with the guests, is enjoying the celebrations, he's been invited to this wedding. A simple social activity that both you and I live in in, this, in the freedom of our nation today. Is that true? We go to weddings and feasts and, and all sorts of things. But he cannot deny the fact that Jesus came to serve and to help. Hence, the water was turned into wine at the request of his mother. Whatever he says, do, she says. And another great picture, you can visualize exactly what John saw describing this very early miracle, this first miracle, where Jesus' humanity is established. He is there to bring blessing. He is there to make the occasion special. When we meet the Father face to face, Jesus is going to be there to make the occasion special. Because by his grace and by his blood and because of his power that I am accepted by grace into his presence. Humanity is clearly established in the power of God. He is one, the son of man. Two, he is the son of God. Chapter three, Jesus now shows that he is the divine teacher. John writes it down so clearly. See, we see here that Jesus has an encounter with the leader of the Sanhedrin at that time, Nicodemus, Israel's teacher. A famous man, a man full of the knowledge of the history of Israel. And right here, he reveals alone that he is the divine teacher. From here on in, we read in every gospel, from here on in, from this point, that Jesus is called teacher. Jesus is called master. Jesus is called rabbi. It all started when Jesus starts to instruct Israel's teacher, and who was trained under Gamaliel, by the way, Nicodemus. And so Nicodemus says, I've never heard such teaching. How can a man enter his mother's womb a second time? Jesus said, you must be born again. And suddenly everybody knew that Jesus not only was a mighty miracle worker, he was a teacher, he was a rabbi, he was the master. And so John is clearly saying, make sure that you, you know who your Lord is. He is the teacher, he is the master, he is, he is the one that says, I came that you might have life in all its fullness. Chapter 4. Jesus, the soul winner in this chapter, the central figure of, we, we see is the Samaritan woman. Now, the, the, the Jews had zero time for the, for the Samaritans. 
They would bypass Samaria. They would walk a great distance to go around Samaria. But Jesus said, I need to go through Samaria. And he has this encounter with the woman at the well. And he tells her that about all that she's ever done in her life. She goes back to her village and she starts to proclaim the man that told me all I ever knew. And then she comes back and gets him and takes Jesus. Now, three days out of the life of Jesus, three and a half years of ministry is a long time, friends. But Jesus Christ goes to a place where nobody else will go to from the Jews and he spends three days and the entire village gets saved. Is Jesus not a soul winner? Does he go out of his way to where the rejected and the lost are? Yes, and he spends time with them of his entire ministry life. How do you think it would be if Jesus came back to earth for three and a half years and spent three days in Grafton? Yeah, wow is the answer. Because we know of his deity and his greatness. But Jesus is a soul winner. And every soul mattered to Jesus. Even the most despised, the most rejected, the most outcast that people walk around, Jesus walked into and brought transformation. I love the fact that John paints this wonderful picture that Jesus Christ is a soul winner. Amen? Oh, right up to the point of the cross. Right up to the point of the cross. There's two thieves, one on the left, one on the right. And he says, the one thief says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. This was a rejected man. This was a man found guilty. This was a man who knew in his own righteousness he had nothing. As Jesus did in the fourth chapter of John's gospel, he does at the very end of his life. He can't help it. Jesus Christ is the soul when he loved his creation. He loves humanity. You like this? Chapter 5. Here John shows us that Jesus is the great physician. He's the, doc he's the great doctor. Here Jesus is with the sufferers at the pool of Bethesda. This is where John says there was a great multitude of sick, blind, lame, paralyzed people. And right here, Jesus heals a, a, a lame man immediately, as he does many times post this. But it's the first mention of this type of healing of what Jesus did throughout his ministry life. And interestingly, the pool of Bethesda is at the sheep's gate. Interesting that the sheep's gate. We are all sheep. We have the good shepherd. And so Jesus, the good shepherd, always caring for the sick sheep, Jesus Christ, we see it so clearly, the great physician. Chapter 6, a picture John paints for us here, is Jesus is the bread of life. In verse 1, we find Jesus about to feed 5,000 with loaves and fishes, the bread. And then he uses the disciples to hand out the bread that is blessed from heaven. Jesus is the bread of life. He puts who he is into our hands for us to give to those who are hungry. I find that amazing. I have a picture of that, of Jesus giving Peter just this bread. That's just bread. There's 5,000. He's got this little bit of bread. He says, now go and feed this group over here. Are you kidding? This? He takes it over and he starts to break it. And as he breaks it, it multiplies and it multiplies. And he turns back to John. He says, hey, John, check it out. It works. So he goes over to that section. And then Luke goes over to this section. And, that, and suddenly everybody is fed because Jesus Christ has become a part of the bread of life. You know, he says to John, Peter, Greg, David, every one of us, here's my bread, take it, I'll multiply it, give it to those who are hungry and they'll never hunger again because I am the bread of life. He paints such a picture. I get so excited about this. In verse 35, in chapter 6, he says, I say to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. He is our daily bread. Where have you heard that before? The disciples come to, the, to Jesus and they say, Lord, teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Next line, give us this day our daily bread bread teach us pray this way jesus said father give me the bread give me who you are that i might give to those if i give out of myself it'll perish and pass away but if i give from you the bread of life they will never hunger again 
He is our daily bread, friends. Chapter 7. Here John shows us not only was Jesus Christ the bread of life, but he shows us that Jesus is the living water. He is the water of life. In verse 37 and 38 of chapter 7, it says, On the last great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus on the cross, when his side was pierced, out of his side flowed blood and water, the water of life. John's picture is this. If you, dr if you are thirsty, drink from the living water that Jesus gives you. Chapter 8. Jesus, the defender of the weak. I could have wrote Jesus, the defender of Greg right here. And you can put your own name there. But right here we see Mary Magdalene is about to be stoned. You all know the picture. You've seen it in your head. They, she's been caught in the act of adultery. She's there, laying there, virtually naked. And then he says to these guys, let he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Jesus intervenes and she's both forgiven and she's restored to wholeness. She is saved and she is healed. I was broken. Every accusation that could be made against me would have had a ring of truth about it. But Jesus looks at me with his blood and he says, I forgive you. And from his word spoken over my life, I am healed, I am redeemed, I am restored. He is a defender of the weak, you and I. As John knows so well, that he has the ability to stop the weapons formed against you. The things that would strike you to death, he deflects and gives you life. Just like Mary, he truly is the defender of the weak. He is the defender of you and I. He is the defender of every broken, downcast, outcast person in, his, in society. He loves everyone individually. He is the defender of the weak. Chapter 9. Jesus Christ, the light of the world. A man born blind receives sight from Jesus. When Jesus touches his eyes... Can you imagine? In darkness your whole life, Jesus touches your eyes, you open them up, and suddenly light comes in. And what is standing in the middle of that light? The face of Jesus. The song, Amazing Grace, by John Newton. I once was blind, but now I see. My eyes have been opened. You've seen this. Oh, he became religious. He's seen the light. Yeah, the light of Jesus Christ because he is the light of the world. Jesus says, I must do my Father's work while I am with you. That's what he says in, in John chapter 9. For as long as I am in the world, he says what? I am the light of the world. Chapter 10. Jesus, the good shepherd. What a picture this paints. Nearly the whole chapter is on the good shepherd verse 11 says he watches over the flock with infinite care and gives his life for the sheep john shows us this picture so clearly that jesus is our good shepherd he is my shepherd praise god for that you know when the she sheep need direction he takes us to where there are green pastures he takes us to where there is water the picture is this that he goes to prepare a place for the sheep that where the sheep is is safe and protected and they're covered and they're loved and they hear his voice and they follow him he is my shepherd and i want to hear his voice i pray that as you read the 10th chapter of john you will see him as your good shepherd and let him lead you and guide your paths chapter 11 he is the prince of life here he calls Lazarus from the tomb, showing us again that death has to yield to the word of Jesus Christ. He has all authority. And it says right here alone, he alone is the resurrection and the life. Truly life and death are in the hands of Jesus Christ. And like Lazarus, we're no longer slaves to sin, are we not? We're no longer slaves to death. Imagine John witnessing this and trying to write down when Jesus calls Lazarus out of the grave, carries him, calls him out of the tomb, and Lazarus comes forth, and then he says to those around him, take off the bindings that have held him and let him be loosed. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Life. 
chapter 12. He is the king. Here he rides into Jerusalem, acclaimed as their king, the king of Israel by the crowds. But the picture here now and always will be that Jesus Christ must not only be king there, he is the king of your heart, the king of your life. He is the king of, of John's life. Jesus must be enthroned in our lives. He must be first and foremost. John is saying, God, I thank you for sending Jesus Christ, my Lord, my God, and my King, and I will serve him all the days of my life. That whole chapter is based on the life of the King. Chapter 13, John now shows the picture of the servant, Jesus Christ. The most beautiful chapter here is this, that Jesus washes the disciples' feet. Have you ever had a picture of that in your head, what that would be like? Imagine we come back to, to Jesus visiting Grafton for three days in his earthly ministry and he washes each one of your feet. How are you going to cop that? I know it must have been incredibly hard because Peter said, no, don't. But Jesus said, if I don't, then you have no part in me. Then Jesus, and Peter said, wash every part of me then. But here's the interesting thing that nobody talks about, and I saw this really clearly, that Jesus knew who was about to betray him. His name was who? Judas. And yet what Jesus does... He kneels down, even though the hand of the betrayer is right in front of him, Jesus kneels down and washes his feet. Because Jesus said, he who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven must become the servant of all, everyone. And by example, he showed us that to be a servant means to sacrifice, even though the person may have betrayed you, the person may have hurt you, the person's going to lead you to death's door. Can you? carry the grace of Christ he taught us how to be a servant because he lived it chapter 14 Jesus the comforter right here just before the cross he tells them that he will send the comforter the Holy Spirit so that they know that they're never alone for again right here he said I am the way the truth and the life and nothing will take you from my hand and verse 27 in John chapter 14 says my peace I give who to you what an amazing comforter Jesus was and still is today in every area of life I, uh, I happened to be with a friend Alan Cummins who passed away on Friday night but he was surrounded by family and friends and the word of God was being spoken over his life I spoke Psalm 91 over Alan I prayed with him as well and the thing was he was comforted by the very word but not just the word the living presence of Jesus Christ and quietly he slipped he swept into eternity on, Thursday, on Friday night you know God is faithful to all generations for those who put their trust in him will never be put to shame I love the power of God at work daily in our lives chapter 15 Jesus the true vine the true vine in this chapter John shows us another brilliant picture that Jesus is the source of all spiritual fruit go out and be fruitful and multiply in verse 8 John says by this my father is glorified that you will bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples friends without him we can do nothing but with him everything is possible truly we abide in the life blood of the vine chapter 16 Jesus is the giver of the spirit when he was departing he made this promise in verses 7 and 8 nevertheless I tell you the truth it is to your advantage that I go away for if I do not go away the helper will not come to you but if I depart I will send him to you and when he comes he will convict the world of, of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Jesus gives each one of us, friends, the access to his Holy Spirit. That's what sustained the apostles during the time of their trial and the disciples of the first century and what sustains and strengthens the church of the 21st century. He has given us his Holy Spirit that we are never alone. Chapter 17, Jesus, the great intercessor. John painted this picture for us that he wanted, he wasn't just praying for his disciples alone. Jesus was praying for everyone. In verse 20 to 22 of chapter 17, Jesus says, I do not pray for these ones alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. 
What a prayer for us to embrace and carry in our hearts. If Jesus is one with the Father and we are one with Jesus, then we are also a one with the Father. How wonderful. Chapter 18. Interesting one, the model sufferer. Nobody likes to suffer, but Jesus shows us how. Here John shows how Jesus willingly drinks the cup of suffering that was set before him and poured out from the Father. That's right, the Father put the cup in his hand. Remember Jesus in Gethsemane goes away quietly to pray and he kneels down and he's praying and tears of blood are coming from him, sweating drops of blood. And he says, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. This cup he's talking about is the cup of suffering and trial. But he did it so you and I might have access to the Father. Here John shows us that if Jesus hasn't ta hadn't taken that cup of suffering, you and I would have had to do it and we could never have borne the suffering that Jesus did to take the sin of the world. So John shows every believer who thinks they're suffering, Jesus Christ, he is the model sufferer. He knows of his inheritance. He knows what the Father's asked him to do. He just was obedient to do it. Chapter 19, we're nearly done, you okay? Good. Chapter 19, the uplifted saviour. Right here where John watched again firsthand, standing next to Jesus' mother, Mary, and the other Mary, how Jesus was lifted up on the cross because he was obedient to the Father's will, obedient even to death on the cross. Not only beaten and scourged, but, but betrayed and, and rejected, he died for us. And what John described and saw as an uplifted saviour, a picture that every one of us see in our mind's eye. I told you this at the start of the message. Even right now, John's gospel keeps us focused on the Saviour who was lifted up and took the sin of the world upon him for everyone to see. It was there, that beaten part of humanity. Chapter 20, Jesus, the conqueror of death. Do you know, four times in Jesus' ministry, we read about Jesus overcoming death. Firstly, we see with Jairus' daughter, the, that, that religious leader. He comes, Jesus goes, and Jairus' daughter is made whole. The widow's son, he had compassion on another mother who had lost her son. He lays hands on her and the, and the boy rises up. Lazarus comes from the tomb and lastly, Jesus himself when he comes out of the tomb on the third day. Entering the depths of hell itself and taking the keys of death captive and conquering it once and for all. So that everyone who believes in Jesus Christ is no longer held captive by death. Oh death, where is your sting? Jesus Christ has overcome it and in him I put my faith into everlasting life. Chapter 21, the end of the gospel. The restorer of the penitent, penitent. That means those who are sorrowful or repentant. That's what penitent means. And so we see here that John gives us a beautiful picture of Jesus restoring Peter on the beach. After Jesus has been crucified, Peter doesn't know what to do and all his plans are broken down. He goes back fishing and yet Jesus stands on the beach, calls out to him and, they, and John recognises that it's, Peter, that it's Jesus and, John, and Peter dives in the water, swims to the beach and Jesus there on the beach restores him and he says to him three times, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me more than this? Lord, you know I love you. Thirdly, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Then feed my sheep. And if we confess that we love Jesus and he's restored us, our role is set before us, friends, to feed the sheep. Jesus restores us back to what we were created to be in the, in the beginning. John shows each of us that it's always Jesus' heart for the lost and the broken and to use his disciples to change the world. He truly is our restorer. So there you have it, friends. The entire Gospel of John, the 21 chapters right through, pictures and paintings and words right through. Now, I know that's just a brief synopsis and an overview, but if you now look at the Gospel of John, everywhere you see those words, teacher, healer, master, saviour, prince of peace, son of God, son of man, shepherd, everything, it's in the Gospel of John to help you and to equip you for serving him and sharing your love for him and knowing him and giving him authority and authorship over your life. So you look at those 21 again. One, Jesus. You put Jesus in front of every one of these. The son of God, the son of man, the divine teacher, the soul winner, the great physician, the bread of life, the water of life, the defender of the weak, the light of the world, the good shepherd, the prince of peace, the king, the servant, the comfort of the true vine, the giver of the spirit, the great intercessor, the model sufferer, the uplifted saviour, the conqueror of death and the restorer of the repentant. This is my Jesus. This is your saviour. 
This is a gospel that has stood the test of time. It was given to the youngest disciple who lived to be the oldest and continues to speak life to every one of us today. If I can show you anything, every chapter is a living picture of the promises of Jesus Christ to you and I in the trials and difficulties of this world. I will not look at those. I will keep my eyes on my Saviour and to him be all praise and glory now and forevermore in Jesus' name. And everyone hopefully said, Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you guys. Thank you for just spending that time with me this morning. I just, I, I just think in this day and age right now, with so much news coming, uh, so much keeping people off balance, so many things that are changing day by day, stick to him who is unchanging. His grace is unfailing. His, his promises to you are never ending. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Amen.